Chapter 20, Principles and Techniques of Disinfection. During patient treatment, surfaces in equipment and treatment rooms are likely to become contaminated with saliva or by aerosol containing blood, saliva, or both. Laboratory studies have shown that microorganisms may survive on environmental surfaces for varying periods. Assume that if a surface has had contact with saliva, blood, or other potentially infectious materials, it contains live microorganisms. Environmental Infection Control. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, Guidelines for Infection Control in Dental Healthcare Settings, 2003, divide environmental surfaces into clinical contact surfaces and housekeeping surfaces. Housekeeping surfaces include floors, walls, and sinks. Because they have a much lower risk of disease transmission, cleaning and decontamination are not as rigorous as that for clinical areas and patient treatment rooms, uh, treatment items, which means that basically you're not going to be cleaning the floor, the walls, or the sinks as much. The sinks maybe because um, sometimes you do use the sinks a lot, especially the doctor, they'll, they'll um, you, polish a crown or if you're re-cementing a crown that came off, um, they have to clean out the old cement out of the crown. So sometimes they'll do it over the sink with water, et cetera. So sometimes the sink will be cleaned much more frequently than would the floors or the walls. Cleaning and disinfecting consideration. Um, the amount of direct patient contact the type and frequency of hand contact, the potential amount of contamination by aerosol and spray, and other sources of microorganisms, for example, dust, soil, and water. So that includes the counters, the drawer handles, the cabinet handles, et cetera. Anything that you um, may come di in direct contact with, how often it's touched, and um, of course, the potential of aerosol. So if it's close to the hand pieces, or it's close to the patient's head where everybody's working, more than likely it's going to be um, contaminated by aerosol and spray. Clinical contact surfaces, they can be directly contaminated either by spray or spatter generated during dental procedures or by contact with dental professionals gloved hands. Um, current infection control guidelines of the office safety and asepsis procedures Research Foundation, also known as OSAP, recommend that clinical surfaces be classified and maintained under three categories. So the three categories are touch, transfer, splash, spatter, and droplet. Touch surfaces are directly touched and contaminated during treatment procedures. So this includes the handles of the dental lights, the controls of the dental units, chair switches, chair side computers, pens, telephones, containers of dental materials, and drawer handles. Transfer surfaces are not directly touched, by, uh, touched, but often are touched with contaminated instruments. This include instrument trays and handpiece holders. Splash, spatter, and droplet surfaces do not actually come in contact with members, the dental team, or the contaminated instruments or supplies. The countertops are a major example. You're not really touching them, but there's a uh, spatter and there's splash and there's droplets that fall onto these surfaces, even if you cannot see them. Surface contamination. There are two methods of dealing with surface contaminations. So one is surface barriers by using barriers, okay, and pre-cleaning and disinfecting surfaces between the patients, and this is an absolute must. So surface barriers. Uh, there's a wide variety of surface barriers available today. They should be resistant to fluids to keep microorganisms in saliva, blood, and other liquids from soaking through to the surface and underneath. Some plastic bags are designed in the shape of items such as the dental chair, the air water syringe, hoses, pens, and light handles. Plastic barrier tape is frequently used to protect smooth surfaces. For example, touch pads on equipment, electrical switches, on chairs, and x-ray equipment. Aluminum foil can also be used because it is easily formed around any shape. I mean, I've never seen this, but apparently it's a thing. 
So single-use disposable items. That means single-use, just like paper plates, paper cups, and uh, plastic cutlery. It's single-use. You don't wash them, although you can. Um, you don't wash them. They're supposed to use, be used once and then discarded. So they're used on only one patient and then discarded. So they help reduce the chance for patient-to-patient -patient contamination. Single-use items are often made of plastic or less expensive metals, and they are not intended to withstand cleaning, disinfection, or sterilization. They're just meant to be used once and thrown out. Never process, which means clean, disinfect, or sterilize single-use items for use on another patient. And like they said, most of these things um, are usually going to be plastic, so you don't disinfect or you don't sterilize. If you sterilize and it's by submersion, um, sometimes the uh, the liquids that you use, the chemicals that you will use, um, it will basically disintegrate the plastic. Um, so it, it's not meant to disinfect or sterilize. It's just one use. In most areas, contaminated disposable items that are not sharps and are not soaked or caked with blood may be discarded with the regular office trash. So uh, the suction tips, the HV for the high volume evacuation, um, that can be discarded inside the regular trash and the saliva ejectors, which are like the little uh, pieces that are bendable that they put in your mouth and they tell you to close your lips around it, that stuff can be discarded in with the regular trash unless they were part of an extraction or a procedure that had a lot, a lot of blood, then that stuff needs to be put in a red bag and discarded in the um, biohazard container. There is no need to discard these items in a medical waste or a biohazard container. Like I said, only if it's saliva and debris, no, no um, massive amounts of blood. State and local regulations may vary, so always consult the regulatory agency for your area. Okay, what are the two methods that deal with surface contamination? Those are surface barriers and surface disinfection. Pre-cleaning and disinfection. Although no cases of cross-infection have been linked to dental treatment room surfaces, cleaning and disinfection of these surfaces are most important components of an effective infection control program. In addition, the OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard requires that contaminated work surfaces be disinfected between patient visits. Um, this is a must. You, you shouldn't skip this. Even if it's um, just a regular checkup exam where there's not a lot of saliva, not a lot of blood. The counters should be wiped off. The chairs should be wiped off after the patient leaves and barriers um, need to be changed if there's any barriers that were put on to begin with. Pre-cleaning. Pre-cleaning means to clean before disinfecting. So all contaminated surfaces must be pre-cleaned before they can be disinfected. Even if there is no visible blood on the surface, it must be pre-cleaned because even a thin layer of saliva on the surface can decrease the effectiveness of the disinfectant. Pre-cleaning reduces the number of microbes and removes blood and saliva, also called bio-burden. Most effective when used on contaminated surfaces that are smooth and easily accessible for cleaning. Always wear utility gloves, masks, protective eyewear and protective clothing when pre-cleaning and disinfecting because you don't know the chemicals that they're going to be using at the office where you are, so it's better to be safe. Surfaces that are irregular or textured are difficult or impossible to clean or to disinfect. Regular soap and water may be used to pre-clean, but it is more efficient to select a disinfectant that can be used to clean as well as disinfect. Disinfection. It's intended to kill disease producing microorganisms that remain on the surface after pre cleaning. Spores are not killed during disinfecting procedures. Do not confuse disinfection with sterilization. Sterilization is a process in which all forms of life are destroyed. And this includes when you sterilize the when you sterilize the instruments in the autoclave, that's killing 
um, all types of bacteria that may be on those instruments because it's at a very high temperature and with steam. Um, there's also sterilization for stuff that cannot be put in the autoclave. There's also sterilization in a bath, what they call a bath, where you put a, a special liquid in it. You submit the um, instruments or the whatever it is that cannot be put in the autoclave, but you need to clean and it's reusable. You put it in there and you let that sit for however long it says on the bottle. Sometimes it's uh, six hours, sometimes a short period of time. That's why you need to read the instructions so you know how long it can sit in that bath. Chemicals that are applied to in inanimate surfaces, for example, uh, countertops and dental equipment. Antiseptics are antimicrobial agents that are applied to living tissue. Disinfectants and antiseptics should never be used interchangeably because tissue toxic toxicity and damage to equipment can result which means if it's an antiseptic, it's usually meant for skin, for tissue. Um, this a disinfectant is usually meant for um, non-living stuff, like inanimate objects or surfaces. Disinfectants are chemicals that destroy or inactivate most species of pathogenic disease-causing microorganisms. In dentistry, only those products that are EPA registered hospital disinfectants with tuberculos tuberculocidal kills the tuberculosis bacteria, claims should be used to disinfect dental treatment areas. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is highly resistant to disinfectants, and if a disinfectant will inactivate M tuberculosis, it will inactivate, inactivate the less resistant microbial families, for example, bacteria, viruses, and most fungi. So if something says that it can kill the, um, the bacteria of tuberculosis, it's pretty good. It's pretty much good to kill any other type of uh, viruses or bacteria. Ideal surface disinfectant. An ideal surface disinfectant would rapidly kill a broad spectrum of bacteria, have residual activity and minimal toxicity, not damaged surfaces to be treated, be odorless and inexpensive, and work on surfaces with remaining bio burden, and it should be uh, simple to use. No single disinfecting product on the market today meets all these criteria. So when selecting a surface disinfectant, you must carefully consider the advantages and disadvantages of various products. Disinfectant precautions. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations for mixing and diluting, because some of these things will come in gallons and they will be concentrated. So it will tell you the ratio of water that you have to use to dilute. That's why you need to read the, um, the bottle, um, the application technique, the shelf life, and shelf life means how long is, will it be good if you buy a case of it and you don't really use it um, too quickly? How long would it last? In a um, on a shelf or in a closet or in a storage closet or etc. The activated use life and all safety warnings. I iota fours, EPA registered intermediate level hospital disinfectants with tuberculosidal action. Because iota fours contain iodine. They may corrode or discolor certain metals and may temporarily cause reddish or yellow stains on clothing and other surfaces. Synthetic phenyl compounds. EPA registered intermediate level hospital disinfectants with broad spectrum disinfecting action. Phenyls can be used on metal, glass, rubber, or plastic. It may also be used as a holding solution for instruments. However, phenyls leave a residual film on treated surfaces. By the, what they mean by a holding solution is like the bath that I was speaking about earlier. It can be used to um, sterilize that way in, in like, a, like a small bath where you just dip the, in, uh, you dip the instruments or whatever it is you're trying, you're trying to sterilize that cannot go in the autoclave. Synthetic phenyl compound is prepared daily. So whatever you're going to use for the day, that's prepared at the beginning of the day and then the next day, um, you prepare what you're going to use for that day. So sodium hypochlorite, uh, which is also the, that's the chemical name for household bleach, 
is a fast-acting economical and broad-spectrum intermediate level disinfectant. It's a 1 to 100 dilution for surface decontamination. Bleach solution is unstable, must be prepared daily, has a strong odor, and is corrosive to some metals, destructive to fabrics, and irritating to the eyes and skin. It may eventually cause plastic chairs and covers to crack. This is why you don't really, the offices don't really use bleach uh, for disinfecting or cleaning because it leaves a very strong smell even when diluted. Um, so sodium hypochlorite, um, learn this name and memorize it because remember one of the uh, previous lessons I said that, um, well, I was talking about safety goggles that I said how the bleach fell in my eyes when we were doing a root canal procedure. Um, most of the time, the dentist will not say, um, prepare me some bleach syringes because that alarms the patient. The patient's going to be like, you're using bleach in my mouth? No. So what the dentist will say is um, prepare sodium hypochlorite and then you're going to know that it's uh, diluted bleach and you're going to put them in the disposable syringes to irrigate the nerve during a root canal procedure. So remember that, sodium hypochlorite. Alcohol. Alcohols are not effective in the presence of blood and saliva. They evaporate quickly and are damaging, damaging to certain materials such as plastics and vinyl. It's not recommended as a surface disinfectant by several agencies. So before, this is what was used to disinfect alcohol because there was really nothing else. However, it's not ideal because um, alcohol does not stay on the surface for a really long time. If you ever wipe something with alcohol, you can see it evaporating almost immediately. So in order for something to be disinfected or sterilized with alcohol, it actually has to sit for a while and alcohol is not, you're not able to do that with alcohol. That's why it's not used for that. So immersion disinfectants. Some chemicals on the market can be used for sterilization or high level disinfection. When used as sterilants, they destroy all microbial life, including bacter bacterial endospores. Depending on the type, time for sterilization can range from six hours to 30 hours. And that's what I was talking about. Um, there's disinfectants that you use like in a small bath and then you submerge either your instruments or whatever you're trying to clean that cannot go in the autoclave. And that's why you have to read the bottle because some disinfectants work in six hours, some work in 12 hours, some require 30 hours for, actually, for it to actually um, sterilize whatever you put in there. At weaker dilutions or with shorter contact time, these chemicals provide high-level disinfection, inactivating all microorganisms except endospores. Most of these chemicals are toxic and can irritate the eyes, the skin, and the lungs. PPE must be worn when these chemicals are used, and PPE, PPE is just protective, uh, personal protective equipment. So your goggles, your mask, gloves, etc. Fluoraldehyde is classified as a high-level disinfectant sterilant. It can also be used as a liquid sterilant when immersion time is greatly increased. So it can be used uh, like in a bath, but it depends how many, however long you need to leave it in there for in order to be uh, considered uh, sterilant. Useful for plastics and other items that cannot withstand heat sterilization. So it's very toxic. It should be handled carefully to avoid the fumes and glueraldehyde treated instruments should never be used on patients without first being thoroughly rinsed with water. So after those instruments or whatever you're putting in that bath, after it's done uh, sterilizing, you need to properly uh, rinse those instruments out. You just cannot take them, dry them, and use them directly in the mouth. Prolonged contact of certain types of instruments with glueraldehyde solutions can lead to discoloration and corrosion of the instrument surfaces and cutting edges, edges. Chlorine dioxide. Chlorine dioxide is an effective rapid environmental surface disinfectant. It takes three minutes or chemical sterilant if you use it for, for six hours. Chlorine dioxide does not readily penetrate organic debris and must be used with a separate cleaner. Chlorine di dioxide must be prepared fresh daily. It must be used with good ventilation and it is corrosive to aluminum containers. Or the zolaldehyde, classified as a high level disinfectant, 
OPA is effective in achieving high level disinfection within 12 minutes at room temperature. It's more expensive than glucuronaldehydes, sorry, but may be a good alternative for individuals with a sensitivity to glucuronaldehydes. It has very little odor and does not require activation or mixing. Orthozolaldehyde disadvantages. Costly, it can be used only half as long as most glucuronaldehydes in dentistry. It may stain the skin and fabrics. The plastics turn a blue-green color where proteins have never uh, have not been removed and should require more than 30 hours to secure would require more than 30 hours to secure sterilization. So it's more expensive and it takes a lot longer for something to be sterilized using this chemical. Okay, so what disinfectant can leave a reddish or yellow stain that we spoke about um, earlier? Okay, the answer to that is iodophores. They can leave a reddish or, stain, or yellow stain because they contain iodine. Um, also, what is a more common term for sodium hypochlorite? Remember what I said? Remember the word sodium hypochlorite? Okay, it's also a word for household bleach. So the evacuator system. The high volume evacuation, which also is also known as HBE, reduces the risk of saliva escaping from the patient's mouth. Regular cleanings help tubes and pipes flow easier. They clean by flushing with detergent or water. It's like with a bucket at the end of the day. Periodically clean the traps. Housekeeping surfaces. No scientific evidence showing that housekeeping surfaces, for example, floors, walls, and sinks, pose a risk for disease transmission in dental health care settings. Majority of housekeeping surfaces need to be cleaned only with a detergent and water or an EPA registered hospital disinfectant or detergent. However, used solutions of detergents or disinfectants, especially if prepared in dirty containers, stored for long periods of time, or prepared incorrectly, may be reservoirs for microorganisms. Make fresh cleaning solution each day, discard any remaining solution, and let the container dry to minimize bacterial contamination. Carpeting and cloth furnishings. So carpeting is more difficult to clean than is non-porous hard surface flooring, and it cannot be reli reliably disinfectant, especially after contamination with blood and other body substances. Studies have documented the presence of bacteria and fungi in carpeting. Cloth furnishings pose similar contamination risks in areas where direct patient care is performed and where contaminated materials are handled. The CDC guideline is avoid using carpeting and cloth upholstered furnishings in dental operatories, laboratories, and instrument processing areas. So that's why uh, the, ch the patient chair, the operator chair, which is the doctor's chair, and the dental assistant chair, they have like a synthetic leather material because it's much easier to wipe. If that, if that was actually a, a fabric or any other type of material, that would harbor so much bacteria and blood and saliva and stuff. Also, offices that have um, carpeting in the operatories, um, that's also, you're not supposed to because everything that falls on the carpet, you can't clean the carpet, you can't shampoo the carpet daily. If it's a, like a vinyl flooring or tile or wood floor, it's much more easier to clean at the end of the day than it would be if it, if it was carpet. Um, in the office where I used to, uh, the company that I used to work for, uh, when I first started working there, they had carpeting because they had the operatories, like the patient rooms side to side. So in order for you to go into the second room, you had to cross in front of the first room. Even if there was a patient there, you would have to bring another patient through the first operatory to get to the other to the operatory on the other side. They used to have carpet in that area, like the little walkway where the patients would walk from one room to the next. And then they would have vinyl flooring in the area where the patient chair was and the, oper uh, the operator chair and the dental assistant chair. They would have vinyl flooring there because that would be easier to wipe if anything fall on the floor, etc. However, that little piece of fabric that was
for not. Vacuuming is a uh, carpet is not a feasible way to disinfect or to clean. Spills of blood and body substances. So the majority of blood contamination in dentistry results from spatter and the use of rotary or ultrasonic instruments. No scientific evidence shows that HIV, HIV, or HCV has been transmitted from a housekeeping surface. Ultra requires that blood spills and other body fluids be removed and the surfaces disinfected. The CDC guideline, clean spills of blood or other potentially infection materials and decontaminate the surface with an EPA registered hospital disinfectant with low level to intermediate activity, depending on the size of the spill and the surface porosity. So greener infection control. Protecting the environment has become an important part of our personal lives and in our homes. That responsibility extends to the provision of dental care. Many of the infection control products and procedures we must use to protect our patients and ourselves have a negative impact on the environment. By altering a process or a material, it is possible, possible to minimize a potentially negative impact on the environment. For example, using disinfectant wipes instead of spraying disinfectants could reduce the amount of chemicals in the air. This is very true. That's why a lot of places now have the, the cavid wipes, the cavicide wipes, um, because it's much easier to clean stuff and to, dis and to kind of disinfect stuff than it would if you were spraying. Uh, going greener requires thoughtful planning, research, and experimentation. Paper. Digital patient records could have a significant impact on the amount of paper that is used. Radiology. Digital radiology is rapidly becoming state of the art. So no longer do you have to use the, the films and those films have like a little aluminum paper attached to them, which you have to discard um, outside. You can't throw it in the regular trash. So if you are using digital radio radiology, um, it, it eliminates that whole waste. Personal protective attire, so protective barriers present a challenge in the attempt to go greener. Some are recyclable. Surface barriers and pre-cleaning disinfection involves the use of chemical and PPE. 